okay welcome you all so we'll discuss the chapter number three genomics and bioinformatics so let us start with there are two parts in this chapter the first part is genomics and the second part is bioinformatics so we will start with uh, genomics the term genomics was coined by Thomas Roder actually this is a special branch of biotechnology which is dealing with uh, mapping sequencing and analyzing genome so we should know what are genomes actually genome means the sum total genetic material of an individual its total genetic material so study of this that means suppose an organism having this much of length of DNA identifying the different uh, genes of present on this identifying their order and what they really function and how do they interact each other all together comes under genomics our first part of the chapter deals with genomics first of all we will discuss some of the major uh, milestones in the history of genomics total genome sequencing this concept was actually put forward by Craig Winter he is J Craig Winter he is from belong to the Institute National Institute of Health and his colleagues and he actually designed a special mapping of genome or a special sequencing of genome which is known as EST approach let us see what is this EST approach and what EST belongs or what is actually EST ESTs are expressed sequence tag expressed sequence tag actually these are some tags or these are some small DNA fragments fragments which are labeled and these small DNA fragments can be used to locate the gene these ESTs help us to dictate the presence of the gene actually this position is having this particular gene and this is how he developed a technique and we will discuss in detail how ESTs are developed ESTs are actually made from mRNA you know first he took cell isolated mRNA from that mRNAs are formed only of expressed part expressed genome will be there in all the mRNA and these mRNAs are further reverse transcribed using reverse transcriptase and they are labeled ok if they are labeled and instead of before that they are sequenced from both the ends little bit are sequenced and these sequenced parts are labeled and used as ESTs 
okay this est will help us to locate this particular gene on this genome thereby we can easily map the uh, the different genes present on this genome this was the first attempt developed by craig wender and he also proposed one more approach that is shotgun sequencing if you have a big genome accord he first made them into different small small parts each part is sequenced later on they are joined this approach is known as shotgun approach a big task is divided into smaller tasks and each task is done individually electron combining all together to complete the big task this approach is given by craig winter and est approach is also actually put forward by craig winter other institutes starts following craig winter and one of the biggest achievement of whole genome sequencing is human genome project which is a very very big task done by many countries together and it was a herculean task to sequence 3 into 10 to the power 9 base pairs and this could be achieved by a collaborative approach of many many laboratories and scientists all together and it reveals a lot of things like you know human genome is 3 into 10 to the 9 base pairs around 97 percentage is non coding only 3 percentage is coding all these things are actually revealed after human genome sequencing okay now we'll see what are the different types of genomics genomics is having two important types ek hai structural and the other one is functional structural genomics and functional genomics earlier different institutes were concentrating on uh, structural and some other institutes were concentrating on functional genomics now it is in an institute itself you can you can find structural genomics as well as functional genomics studies are done together let us see what is structural genomics structural genomics is actually your mapping sequencing analyzing genome is known as structure functional is you are finding gene gene interaction okay gene function and how does it express all these studies comes together functional genomics and the earlier part is structural genomics see here in your textbook it is given structural genomics is high throughput dna sequencing followed by assembly organization and management of dna sequence that means high throughput means extensive study of sequencing and assembling the sequence and thereby organizing them and managing them all together comes under structural genomics whereas according to your textbook functional genomics is here the the reconstruction of genome to determine the function of genes here we reconstruct that genome we study the genome and we'll make it in order to study the function of genes this comes under functional genomics okay now 
why this genome sequencing is important what are the reason behind it why we do complete genome sequencing there are five points given in your textbook each point is relevant first one it tells us or it help us to discover all genes present in an organism it help us to know what are the different genes present on the genome of an organism the second is you know it it help us to find relationship between genes some genes are related some are working together so relation between genes it also help us to find suppose if you know different genes are working together you can go for some future studies so also help us to go for future experiments then it help us to make an index of genes present on an organism index in the sense the all genes present and how the are they arranged and what each uh, gene actually controls and all together five is once you know the entire genome we can reconstruct that organism okay that entire reconstruction of a genome can be done once you know the entire sequences of a genome so all the five all the five actually these five points are very much important okay moving on to the next part next part is the small scale genome strategies we use what are the strategies we used for genome or all genome sequencing first one is direct sequencing using bac bac is a vector and second is random shotgun sequence actually these two are interrelated each other ek dusre se depend hai and once we see one by one in detail you could easily identify so first of all we see bac directed directed sequencing okay what happens here we take the genome break them them into the pieces of 100 kb size so that they can be cloned to the vector bac and we make library that means the whole genome is fragmented and made into a bac library now this bac libraries are screened and we'll find out some common sequences and these sequences are further sequenced from the ends and they are you they, they are actually sequenced from the end to find out the contics contics are continuous sequences I'll tell you suppose this is one sequence and other sequence start from here so there is an overlapping such sequences are known as contics it can also be like this these are contics so these contics are helped or they are helping us to reconstruct that genome again so we do the entire sequencing to find out the con contics so why this is directed because it goes in one direction either this direction or go this direction okay this direction or this direction so we have a direction and we go towards that direction and we find the entire sequence whereas random shotgun sequencing is you take genome 
break into pieces of small, medium and bigger size. They are cloned again using different vectors. Based on their size, we use different plastid vectors. And again, we make a library. From the library, we randomly select and they are sequenced. These sequences will be feeded in a computer because we require a lot of uh, data and we, we are having a lot of sequences. We keep on sequencing and feeding the data in the computer and by using some software programs we use to make the entire or we use to uh, find the context and the sequence are assembled to get the final genome. So here randomly selected, there it is selected after screening. Here there are different sized fragments, they are only 100 KB size fragments. Here we randomly sequence, there we go in a direction. These are the differences between random shotgun sequencing and Directed sequencing. Okay. Now the last two topic is gene prediction. See what happens at some time. We get a huge number of data this is main sequence now we need to find the number of genes over this DNA sequence so we take some softwares we use some softwares or we use some in silico experiments in silico means using softwares using computers and we predict there are two genes or the computer predict there are two genes or they predict three genes and all generally done on the sequenced genome okay this is a table giving different information regarding the genomes and their number of genes etc some board question this particular portion let us see what is this they have given bacteria yeast worm fly insect that is a plant and an animal that is of course human being you can see here the genome, uh, the part of genome that encodes protein gets reduced. And again when you see, you can see the total number of predicted genes by softwares. This is genome by size. Okay, these are number of chromosomes. Now the question comes here. It says that these predictions are not completely reliable. There are some sort of unreliability. You cannot completely rely upon this. You can take example human being. Human being there are 3 billion base pairs and 20 to 25k thousand number of genes are predicted. But scientists think that there are more than 50,000 of genes. So there is a difference of almost 30,000 which says that there is some unreliability. Okay, I mean, but I 25k hai or agar aap experimentally they can get to up to 26,000. So, okay, almost predictions are here, but it's not difference on a k current. Kabi kabi bold they can there are some sort of unreliability in the in silico prediction. Another major concern, another major question from this part is there is no intuitive correlation between size and number of genes intuitive we say in the same way we say that if there are so many genome size and so many genes if the genome size is more and more then the number of genes will increase so there is no no such intuitive relationship there is no relationship let us take some examples you see worm 
nineteen thousand genes, but whereas fly is having only thirty thousand thirteen thousand genes. See the difference. Worm and we'll take worm and Drosophila. Thirteen thousand six hundred genes only present, whereas worms are having nineteen thousand genes. किसका जीनोम बढ़ा है ऑब्वियसली ड्रोसोफिला का जीनोम बढ़ा है तो हम ड्रोसोफिला एंड वर्म को चेक करेंगे आपस में अगर देखेंगे तो कॉम्प्लेक्सिटी बहुत ज़्यादा किस में है ड्रोसोफिला में जीनोम की कॉम्प्लेक्सिटी तो उतना ही नंबर ऑफ जीन्स यहाँ पे इंक्रीज नहीं हुआ दिस इज दैट दर इज नो कॉरिलेशन दर इज नो कॉरिलेशन बिटवीन इंट्यूटिव साइज और कॉम्प्लेक्सिटी विथ नंबर ऑफ जीन्स इट सेज दैट देर इज नो कॉरिलेटिव और कॉरिलेशन बिटवीन इंट्यूटिव साइज एंड कॉम्प्लेक्सिटी विथ नंबर ऑफ जीन्स दीज आर द टू मेजर कंसेप्ट विच वी हैव टू लर्न फ्रॉम दिस पार्ट ऑफ द चैप्टर दिस हैज बीन आस्ट मेनी ए टाइम्स सो always be careful while answering the first one is unreliability we can explain with the help of homo homo sapiens and the other we can explain with the help of these two okay anyway gene prediction is done with different softwares gene prediction softwares okay now we'll move on to the next part which is single nucleotide polymorphisms snp if you take two individuals dna is are say the same portion of two individual i am taking only one one strand of each individual if same strand a individual person a a person b a अगर किसी एक बेस पेयर में डिफरेंस है बेस पेयर इन द सेंस बेस में डिफरेंस है आई टेल यू यहाँ पे ए है और यहाँ पे उस जगह पे जी है इंडिविजुअल ए में इस पोजीशन में ए है इंडिविजुअल बी में वो उस पोजीशन में जी है दैट मींस इंडिविजुअल ए में जो पेयर होगा ए टी होगा बट इंडिविजुअल बी में जो पेयर होगा वो जी सी है सो देर इज वन न्यूक्लियोटाइड डिफरेंस between the individuals of the same species that is known as single nucleotide polymorphism they are a common variant in dna that can have one of the four bases at a single site here in this site it can have a g t r yeah, c the same way here also it can have a g t and c there are four possibilities and the type of nucleotide present at a given location may vary between two individuals and these one nucleotide changes between two individuals within a population is known as single nucleotide polymorphism now why do why do we study single nucleotide polymorphism single nucleotide polymorphism is having a lot of applications these are positions of snps proposed snps that means in an individual these are the common sites we can see snps if i take another individual he will also have the same changes or same sites where we can have changes and such map is known as snp map or snp profile if you take snp profile of one individual okay and if we compare that with another individual you will find some differences for example these are the different this is the these are the differences between these two individuals rest of the snps are same for them now these two differences may have some advantage as well as disadvantage let us say take an example of a drug we use a drug for treatment of a disease this drug is having good efficacy on this 
this is having less efficacy on this so if we know these two are actually controlling the efficacy of this drug we can recommend this drug to a new patient before recommendation if we do SNP profiling that will help us to decide the type of drug suppose there are 10 types of drugs are there one type match with this second type match with this so if a patient comes to you if you know they belongs to this category will recommend the type 1 drug okay if the person if the patient is of this kind will recommend the type 2 drug suppose the drug is of very costly like uh, cancer treatment and all so we can use SNP profile to check the efficacy of drug towards a patient then another important is see the changes in the genome is having two portions these are expressed portions and the long other areas are non-expressed the SNPs can happen here also as well as here also SNPs at this point help us to find or help us in DNA fingerprinting I'll tell you how generally we see some repeats here in the non-coding region we find repeats okay if a change happens in this repeats the repeat size get reduced they are broken into two pieces so these can be utilized so, one individual may have two pieces length is small and in the other individual may big piece hai, there is no SNP here so what happened when we compare these two sequences we can find this is unique to this individual this is unique to individual and such uh, variable number of tandem tandem means random tandem repeats are used in DNA fingerprinting so DNA fingerprinting is also depending upon SNP one DNA fingerprinting we already discussed with the help of RFLP and this is another DNA fingerprinting which is with the help of uh, tandem repeats and SNP plays an important role here now SNP could be beneficial as well as SNP could be harmful we'll tell you some examples APOE gene APOE gene this is a same this is actually depending with Alzheimer's Alzheimer's disease okay this is Alzheimer's disease a small a single base difference in this particular gene may result into susceptibility of this disease so a small nucleotide change can make the, the individual to have this disease as well as the individual without this disease so SNP is having a role another is CCR5 this is a receptor and simple deletion in the what do you call uh, CCR5 okay leads to resistance on HIV human immunity look this is beneficial this is harmful so SNP can have both harmful effects as well as uh, useful effects another important function or application of SNP is you know uh, how individuals are similar dissimilar which help us to find who is more similar who is actually uh, more different for example uh, like uh, worm yeast okay they have some regions which are very very conserved conserved means less amount of mutation happens here less amount of changes happens here so these help us to find who relates to whom which species this species say relate you know mouse and man they are quite similar mouse and yeast 
they have a lot of dissimilarity so we can say that mouse and human are having a common ancestry and mouse and yeast is having a long back common ancestry is may be kuch similarity hai but is may bohut zyada hai isliye ye dono mein common ancestry bohut jaldi hai isko bohut purani this also actually we can deduce using snps